Uh, my name is Paulo Sotero. I am the director of the Brazil Institute here at the Wilson Center. On behalf of uh, my colleagues, uh, Howard Wolpe, uh, the director of the Africa program, uh, Robert Hathaway, director of the Asia program, uh, I would like to welcome you to the center. And before uh, asking passing the ball here to Howard and who will conduct the first panel of this uh, meeting. Uh, I would like to remind those of you who does not know much about the Wilson Center, uh, this is the living memorial to the 28th President of the United States. Uh, president Wilson is the only U.S. President to have come from the academic world. He was a university professor before he became a politician, and he used to s talk about the importance of those who govern and those who study government to be in close contact <coughs> because that is essential uh, to the quality of public policy. Uh, that's what we try to do here at the Wilson Center. We have been doing this for 40 years. We host here about uh, 800 events such as this every year in a variety of topics. We house over 100 scholars around the year uh, studying and writing about also a variety of topics of interest to the United States and to other countries. Uh, with that, I would like to ask uh, Howard to start us off on this very important topic of emerging powers, India, Brazil, and South Africa, and the future of South-South cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Paulo. I am delighted to be joining with you today and co-hosting this event. The subject is one that has only recently begun to attract the attention it really does deserve. And uh, I was saying in advance to some of the panelists, it's frankly a subject about which I know very little. So I'm really looking forward to, to the discussion this morning. Um, we have a very distinguished panel um, this, in our first uh, grouping here. Um, and I wanted to begin, I just will introduce all before we begin with the presentations. Um, to my immediate left, uh, Ambassador Arun Kumar Singh, is the Deputy Chief of Mission at the Embassy of India. Uh, he assumed his current assignment um, in October of 2008. He served as Ambassador of India to Israel from uh, previously, um, and he has served as the Joint Secretary um, uh, in Delhi, 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 <laughs> Delhi. I know I'm going to I'm going to be really messing up a lot of the uh, pronunciations today. I apologize in advance. Um, uh, dealing first with the United Nations policy and then the Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Iran divisions of the Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, Ambassador Singh first joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1979 after completing his master's degree in economics from Delhi University and teaching at the university for two years. Um, our, our second panelist will be Secretary Francisco Figueiredo de Souza. Uh, he is assistant of the India, Brazil, South Africa division of the Brazilian Ministry of External Relations. Um, he was a member of the Brazilian delegation to the third IPSA summit uh, in New Delhi and to the sixth, fifth ministerial meeting that was held in Cape Town. Before joining the diplomatic service, he worked as a reporter for Foja de Sao Paulo. Uh, currently completing a master's degree uh, candidacy in the international politics program at Rio Branco Institute. He holds a BA in international relations and in journalism. And then our third panelist is Francis Carnegie, uh, an old personal friend of mine uh, who is a South African uh, permanent resident, originally from the United States, whose interests range widely from South Africa foreign policy and the African <clears throat> peace and security agenda to global energy geopolitics. He is a research associate of the Institute for Global Dialogue, focusing on African integration issues, a frequent contributor of, frequent, of critical commentaries 
on his topics of interest to South African newspapers. He is also an occasional commentator on these topics for South African electronic broadcast media. His research agenda uh, over the years has included the consolid consolidating the Africa agenda, promoting multilateralism and global governance, strengthening South-South collaboration, and promoting North-South bridge building in advancing South Africa's national interests. Again, we're delighted to have all four panelists with us, this, uh, the three panelists with us this morning. I also, before we begin, just want to recognize the <clears throat> presence of the uh, Deputy Chief of Mission of the Brazilian Embassy, uh, Mr. Abreu. Is that right? Abreu. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> Welcome. Um, with that, we'll invite our panelists to each make opening remarks of 10 to 15 minutes, if possible, and, and then we will open it up to a, a broader discussion. Uh, Ambassador Singh. Good morning, <coughs> everyone. I've been asked uh, to speak for about 10 to 15 minutes. I'll keep to the time. I'll try and cover as much as I can, and at some stage, if I end abruptly, uh, it's, uh, I, I'm sure my colleagues uh, and friends from Brazil and uh, uh, South Africa will pick up from there. Uh, developing countries, as uh, many of you would know, have talked of the philosophy of South-South cooperation for development for a long time. And in terms of India's policy, in terms of our foreign policy, in terms of economic strategies, it was one of the devi defining features of what we were trying to achieve uh, since we gained independence uh, in 1947. A number of initiatives were launched during the 1960s, the 1970s, uh, but, the, but progress was modest, partly because of a lack of resources, uh, we were still coming out uh, of the colonial phase and also because of institutional weaknesses and lack of communication facilities within and uh, between developing countries. Uh, you would recall that uh, South Commission uh, had been set up, a South Center had also been set up which operated from Geneva uh, for some time. There were many ideas that were floating around, uh, but concrete achievements were somewhat limited. However, subsequently, with the emergence of countries like Brazil, India, South Africa, uh, in this millennium, with considerable capabilities and collective development experiences, there was another opportunity to try and revitalize South-South cooperation. And so if you look at this uh, cooperation process, which was uh, launched in 2003, and is now referred to and widely known as uh, IBSA, India, Brazil, South Africa. We are really bringing together three developing countries uh, from three different continents and three democracies. So I think in a sense that reflects the effort uh, uh, that is being made. All these three countries, besides being developing, are plural, multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilingual, multi-religious, and sharing elements of a common economic and political history. Facing today common challenges, and I have also come together in multilateral fora on more than one occasion for the cause of the developing world. All the three were instrumental in setting up of the G20 group of developing countries in the WTO at the Cancun Ministerial Conference in 2003. And this has since then become an important coalition of developing countries to articulate collective interests of the South in a critical area of negotiations, uh, for example, agriculture. Apart from these shared uh, elements of political and economic history, there are also now significant synergies between th these two countries, given similar but also <coughs> different development experiences and uh, differing strengths in technology uh, and uh, sectors of economy that uh, mm, they have built up. Cooperation in IPSA, therefore, has been broadly on three fronts. First, as a forum for consultation and coordination on significant political issues. Uh, the reform of the UN and its Security Council, WTO negotiations, civilian nuclear cooperation, 
climate change, terrorism. Second, trilateral collaboration on concrete areas and projects through 16 working groups that have been set up among them for the common benefit of the three countries. And third, but not last, assisting other developing countries jointly by taking up projects uh, in these countries. So it is broadly in the framework of these three uh, differing sort of areas of effort that we have tried uh, to move uh, forward. Now, one of the sort of uh, concrete areas where uh, we can see some result, for instance, is that trade uh, among the three countries, was, which was $3.9 billion in 2003-2004, rose to approximately $10.4 billion in 2007 2008. With the emergence of new dynamic enterprises in these three countries, South-South investments and technology transfers have also uh, begun to increase. Going beyond uh, just cooperation between the three countries, we are also trying to use this linkage to widen cooperation in the framework of other linkages uh, that these countries have. Uh, for example, uh, we are moving towards a comprehensive economic cooperation arrangement bringing together members of South African Customs Union, India, and members of the Mercosur uh, group. An exploratory meeting for a possible india mercosur SACU trilateral trade arrangement was held in Pretoria in 2007. And at the third IPSA summit, which was held in New Delhi towards the end of 2008, it was agreed that this uh, TTA, the Trilateral Trade Arrangement, would be pursued in a time-bound time uh, manner. <coughs> Such an arrangement would create a large and expanding economic space and provide a framework to exploit our synergies in trade, technology, and industrialization for our mutual advantage. And pursuing the cooperation that we are, uh, we are doing, we are not limiting it to just government uh, to government uh, cooperation. For example, uh, before the last meeting, uh, the summit meeting uh, in Delhi in October, we also had a meeting of the business forum, the media forum, women's forum, editor, uh, uh, part of the media forum, the editors group, and the, an effort is also being made to set up a parliamentary forum. Uh, again, uh, one of the important things that was emphasized was trying to see if we can bring together a social development strategy uh, in, within the framework of IPSA and then going uh, beyond that. Uh, this would be based on the fact that coming out uh, of uh, uh, the sort of uh, colonized experience and with our own uh, starting from a lower base of development, there are certain challenges uh, that um, uh, we would face in common where would, we would benefit uh, from each other's uh, experience. Now, for example, outlining uh, what could be done in terms of a social development strategy, uh, the Indian Prime Minister had mentioned a few elements, and I'll just uh, mention these uh, <coughs> so that it would explain uh, how there are commonalities in which what we are trying to achieve and how we would benefit from each other's experience and success stories. And he emphasized that to bring about effective and sustain social development in all the three countries or countries with our kind of experience, uh, rapid economic growth would of course be essential because you need to create uh, resources within the framework of which uh, social development uh, can be pursued. But going beyond rapid economic growth, we would have to bring in inclusivity, uh, inclusive economic growth. Uh, it cannot, economic growth cannot happen in <coughs> isolation unless all sections of society derive benefits from such growth and develop a stake in the growth process, uh, there would be social and political uh, instability. And again, those who have seen the efforts made in India over the last uh, five years would find that we were growing at about 9% a year for five years. But even while this was happening, there were deliberate uh, efforts made by the government to also promote inclusive growth to adopt social sector programs such as rural employment guarantee schemes where 
uh, in every family at least one person was guaranteed 100 days of employment. And this was among the things that could also subsequently cushion any of the negative effects of the global financial uh, crisis. Uh, another element would be human resource development. And people have now argued that for any kind of sustained um, growth, you need to uh, focus on health, on education, on human resources, uh, focus on equitable in infrastructure because infrastructure that only tends to benefit certain sections uh, of society or the more developed areas tends to leave out others. Therefore, equitable, social, equitable uh, development of in infrastructure is important. Short-term distress mitigation, grassroots institution building, environmentally sound strategies, integration into the knowledge economy. Now, again, these are elements of a social development strategy that we found very rele uh, relevant in our experience and we believe uh, uh, be best practices uh, based on these are things that we can work with uh, other partners in developing countries. I'd like to also mention to you, uh, by way of example, of some of the uh, funding schemes that we have worked on jointly to support projects in third countries. Uh, for instance, there is an IPSA funding facility as a trust fund under the UNDP. And an amount of $1 million was committed to be contributed by each country uh, uh, for this. Uh, this is for poverty alleviation uh, projects. Uh, it, it took up a project for the development of agriculture and cattle farming in Guinea-Bissau. Another project has been taken up for collection of solid waste in Haiti. Uh, there are other uh, proposals uh, which are being worked upon uh, for example, capacity building in Timor-Leste, fighting against HIV AIDS in Burundi, a project in Laos on integrated watershed management uh, of a river basin, a project in Cape Verde, uh, construction of sports building and uh, at other places. Through the uh, IBSA foreign ministers meeting, uh, Directly through IPSA funding, we are also looking at uh, uh, several projects. Uh, for example, an agro-processing project in Comoros, uh, another in Swaziland, developing youth centers in Mozambique, Lesotho, and Botswana. Uh, then uh, s uh, s uh, smaller level projects, uh, construction of cisterns in Haiti. So these are just some examples to show that through our cooperation, we are not only attempting to widen our linkages, uh, benefit from each other's experience, uh, but also see if, if coming together we can uh, work for uh, projects and uh, support institutions, capacity building and development efforts in other countries. Now, as India has tried to pursue uh, what, what it is doing in the framework of IBSA, uh, this is not really a standalone thing. It is very much a part of what we have been trying to attempt within our limited means and resources uh, with other developing countries. For example, we did set up an Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation Program, ITEC, uh, in 1964, through which we have provided support. And this is now extended to 158 uh, partner countries. In recent years, ITEC activities have also been associated with regional and multilateral organizations like ASEAN, G15, BIMSTEC, AU, ARDO, CARICOM, WTO, and the Commonwealth. Now, among the programs that we have done here, uh, I'll just mention some to give you a sort of sense of uh, what we are attempting. We do bring a large number of uh, trainees in India uh, from ITEC partner countries. And last year, for example, uh, more than 5,000 uh, representatives from developing countries were trained in India uh, under such programs. Uh, we also assist uh, the partner countries on the basis of mutually agreed projects to establish useful infrastructure facilities with technology and skills appropriate to their resources and needs. In sectors where uh, our partners uh, have asked us and where we have capacity, we have also deputed Indian experts to go and uh, work in those countries. Going beyond these, in select areas, we have uh, worked uh, through study tours, uh, grant of equipment, assistance for uh, disaster relief. And one of the programs, for example, that um, uh, has been uh, noted is the assistance we provided to Afghanistan. 
And we are not a traditional donor, but we have provided almost $1.2 billion worth of assistance to Afghanistan as part of the stabilization effort. And this has included uh, supply of uh, 500 buses for the public transportation, building of a 300-kilometer road, building of a 200-kilometer power transmission line, uh, supply of doctors, medicines, rebuilding of schools, rebuilding of hospitals. And this assistance uh, has been uh, widely appreciated and has had some impact uh, on the ground. So let me stop at that, having uh, reached the end of the uh, time slotted to me. My aim was to give you a sense of uh, our basic approach, give you elements of what we've been trying to do in the framework of IPSA and the wider framework of South-South cooperation, cooperation with other developing countries. Of course, if there are any particular specific uh, elaborations, queries anybody might need, I'd be happy to come uh, back to that in the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for a fascinating um, and comprehensive overview of both uh, IPSA objectives and, uh, and activities. Um, the uh, next speaker will be uh, uh, Secretary uh, D'Souza. Thank you very much. Uh, Your Excellency, Ambassador, uh, Minister, Deputy Chief of our mission, of our embassy, and Please Professor Carnegie. Can you speak a little bit louder? Okay, <laughs> I will. Uh, and distinguished organizers and uh, dear colleagues and participants. Uh, first of all, allow me to thank for the opportunity and just say it's my honor and privilege to be here uh, among said distinguished participants. And uh, I may say that personally, Professor Carnegie, for example, is uh, maybe the teacher of my teacher in, in Ibsa Matters due to the role he had to uh, uh, teach maybe or to help uh, Councillor Jean Janezio, who is my, ch my direct chief, in uh, learning a little bit about South Africa's reality. And uh, so being among this group for me is very special and uh, would be special anywhere. It's even more special because we are in the center that we know uh, the relevance it has. Uh, and let me thank also for the invitation for the IPSA division of our Ministry of External Affairs, which I'm proud to represent here today, although I won't be speaking officially. Uh, my words cannot be the Brazilian official position in this matter, although I'm certainly influenced by it. And uh, the way I'll try to contribute to this debate, due to uh, also the difference in terms of experience that I can see here between me and the other uh, participants, is uh, talking a little bit about how we are seeing IBSA from within the forum itself. And But even in this topic, I can see Ambassador is... Uh, very well informed and even uh, the division I had thought to my presentation he already used <laughs> so uh, and this is another proof of convergence I think and also of how Indian diplomacy is prepared and uh, uh, knowing th the different things that are happening in their chancery um, so as he said uh, IBSA is usually referred as having these three different pillars or these three different aspects these external aspect as a political entity uh, that tries some convergence in multilateral fora and in global arena as a whole. Uh, this catalyst for uh, relations amongst the two countries and as a south-south uh, cooperation mechanism due to the formation of the IBSA Fund. Um, well, we know that the forum started, uh, like the beginning of the forum has to do with an idea that President Mbeki uh, raised with President Lula the day President Lula came into office in January 1st, 2003. And um, the first idea was to collectively set a dialogue with the G8, uh, putting together a group of countries that could uh, try to influence the decisions of this small but very influential group of countries, which is the G8. Uh, but from the beginning, however, uh, it became clear that this group that would be formed should be something else, not only um, extra G8, but it had to have some uh, autonomous uh, status and some more comprehensive um, work in order, even if, if the, the uh, objective was to become uh, extra G8, which it hasn't, as we know. Um, and it's interesting to see that IBSA 
is it still there in a world with so many G somethings and G20, <laughs> G33, G90, G70, and so many? Uh, although IBSA doesn't have a specific objective and uh, it's not there to a uh, single reason. So uh, I, I believe the, the way Ambassador has started trying to look at the similarities between the three countries is also uh, maybe related to the reason why this forum is still there with, without a specific reason to exist but trying to work in different areas. Um, there's no single characteristic that, out that isolately can explain IBSA and why IBSA and only these three countries, not some country that's outside or not another country instead of one of them. But uh, maybe altogether the characteristics that the ambassador has um, presented help uh, understanding why, why this format. So we are here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Certainly we should mention first democracy as a characteristic for the three countries. Uh, the fact that all the three have still internal challenges in combating poverty and hunger and they, they recognize that, they try to, uh, to face that issue. Uh, their participation in the developing world, certainly. Uh, their strategic distribution on the globe, each in a different continent and playing an important role in its region. And last but not least, their demonstrated capacity to act in global scale. Uh, and m more than that, I th we believe that they are willing to increase their participation in global affairs. Uh, some recent events, such as uh, the crisis, highlighted their intention to contribute to the construction of a new international architecture. But this idea that they should have new roles to play, and these new roles might come with new responsibilities, is something that these two countries are pursuing for some time. Um, if we take the IBSA declarations, they are always calling for the need of restructuring of global governance to make it more democratic, representative, and legitimate increasing the participation, especially of developing countries in decision-making bodies. Uh, so, having said that, and about the characteristics of the three countries, I would like to uh, invite you to imagine whether or not this forum would have any chance a decade or so ago. Uh, we, we believe I IBSA is also a product of the circumstance, of a moment, and of how uh, leaders have Understand, understood that circumstance and converted it into a meaningful initiative. If we take 10 years or, or a little bit more back, Brazil was um, in its attempts to control inflation or a little bit before consolidating its democracy, the 1988 constitution, and all these processes drew energy that now can be more directed into external action. South Africa had to face the end of uh, apartheid and uh, they and then to wait to settle out the international euphoria that came w in the beginning of Mandela and ANC government. And then uh, little by little, according to uh, the literature, it has reassessed its international ties. India foreign policy had to concentrate for a long time in, 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 in the nuclear issue. And uh, it was also from time to time that other issues could come to, to the agenda with uh, uh, broader um, attention. So only overcoming these challenges, they were able to set IBSA. And, um, but although this happened only six years ago, if we take the uh, votes they are giving in international forum and the perspectives they uh, express in these forum, uh, this similarity comes before that. Uh, it exists maybe because they have similarities internally, maybe because they see the, the, the world in a similar way. That's why President Lula in, his, uh, in the inaugural speech of the first IBSA Forum uh, Summit said that IBSA partially springs from a natural identity of perspectives of the three countries. Uh, and if this identity was already there when IBSA came, uh, the coming into existence of the forum uh, increased the pattern of similar positions they are uh, defending in various international forums. Examples are well known. Uh, Ambassador has mentioned WTO talks. And um, so IBSA has uh, been important not only to bring, bring countries closer, but also, and most importantly maybe, to amplify the, the force of their positions that could be held individually, but that 
by uniting their voice, they know, uh, can be even more influential. Uh, of course, we are talking about a convergence forum. Uh, it, it means countries do not need to agree in everything, although they agree in many things, from Millennium Development Goals to the Middle East peace processes, their posi positions are quite similar. Uh, and the public communiques that are issued at each and every uh, time we have a summit or a ministerial meeting are the uh, testimony of this uh, evolution of positions and, and approximation uh, and how their opinions are common. The coordination among embassies and missions is also existent and part of the process became more frequent with the years and I think these are the main uh, concrete steps that were given in this political part of the forum. When the second pillar, the ambassador has also uh, talked about it, about the internal consequences of the approximation, uh, and that's to maybe wake up a little more th the people that thought our first part was too constructivist. Uh, well, we are talking about three countries that have 1.3 billion people altogether and a GDP of more than three billion, three trillions US dollars uh, nominal or 5.7 maybe in purchase power parity. Their defense forces which recently held uh, their first trilateral maritime exercise are active in, in three different and important regions of the globe and when we put together the areas of these countries in square miles we have something if my calculation is not wrong maybe three times the European Union so these are just a few raw examples of how basic figures show some significance to this alliance and, basic, and, and partially because they, they recognize this, this potential. Uh, during the six years that IBS existed, it became an umbrella for a, a myriad of different initiatives that are broader than the chancelleries and even broader than the executive powers. This was the orientation of the heads of state, again to quote um, our president, President Lula, he said IBSA could not be just a diplomatic uh, in inventive exercise. It had to be more than that. It had to help approaching a little more the societies. So um, this gave the forum more than just this international dimension and help bringing together sectors of public administration uh, and different sectors of civil society, as the ambassador has said, through the 16 working groups and the forums that have met in parallel to uh, the summits. In these working groups, we can see that experiences from one country are sometimes very useful for the other countries. I take the example of our revenue service, which had a very established and traditional cooperation with France. Uh, what the people in our revenue services are saying to us in the IPSA uh, coordination is that their cooperation with France is very important, but sometimes not enough to the kind of challenge they face in Brazil. And when they talk to people in India and South Africa, they talk to people confronting the same challenges of informality, challenges that are not the same in France. France is a country that has its revenue service now uh, towards the uh, European Union in which it's participating. Um, so that's why our revenue service has, for example, uh, held a workshop on, on IT technology and invited people from the other two countries. And on the other hand, we have learned a lot with the South African experience of founding a specific unit for large taxpayers. So these are uh, different things that have been happening in these 16 working groups, exchanging uh, exchange of experiences and uh, uh, trying to learn from the best practices of the other three two countries. Um, about the structure, uh, we know IPSA doesn't have a branch nor a permanent secretary nor even a, a document promulgating its uh, structure. It's an um, open, flexible, informal s s forum that has at the highest level the summits. The summits started in 2006, and last year with the New Delhi summit, we can say a first round of, of summits has ended. So a new round is now about to start again in, in Brasilia. The summit is scheduled to 8 October 2009. And below the, the, the summits of in which the countries are represented by their heads of state and government. Uh, we have the joint commissions presided by the three ministers of external affairs, or now mm. I think international relations and cooperation is the name in South Africa with the new government, also once a year. And this year we are going to the sixth 
joint commission. So that, that means the ministers meet at least twice a year in the IPSA format because they meet when the presidents are together, but they also meet separately to the joint commission. Apart from meetings they usually held at the UN uh, every year. And with uh, more frequency, we have the focal points meeting at the level of vice ministers. They coordinate the working group and the cooperation among the three countries. So to conclude this, the second pillar and, and these comments, uh, papers and exchanges of experiences are the result internally. Before finishing, let us just quickly uh, say something about the IBSA fund and South-South co South -South cooperation. Well, as Ambassador said, it was constituted in 2004. It is managed by UNDP, and it aims at supporting viable and, and projects that can be uh, copied in other places uh, based on the internal best practices of the three IBSA countries and how they can sometimes contribute to national priorities of other countries. And so it's a fund uh, that has a lot of attention to the ownership and to the sustainability of the projects and this focus on the fulfillment of different Millennium Development Goals. Ambassador has mentioned the project in Haiti. Uh, the last report we had showed that it had a kind of airport effect in Carrefour Fay in the community of Port-au-Prince that were attended by the project that now has various initiatives but there was a social uh, risky area some years ago. Uh, also in, in, in Guinea-Bissau, the ambassador mentioned another concluded project of the IPSA fund. Uh, there were different things done in, in this uh, agricultural development cooperation, but I think the m most interesting one is that the use of a new rice seed that the um, capacity builders uh, could uh, offer to Guinea-Bissau allowed that country to have a second harvest every year, which helped combating hunger. Also in Cape Verde, we have concluded now the refurbishment of two health units in a very remote community. And uh, with using local workers, which was also a very interesting experience. New projects are coming, as the ambassador said. I think the most well-known of them is the sports complex in Hamala in Palestine. Also a consequence of IMSA countries participating together in the Middle East peace process, maybe since the Annapolis conference here uh, some years ago. And uh, yet in this third part, and just to conclude, allow me to say something about a question that will probably be raised. We believe approximation by IBSA is not at the expense, of course, of other strategic partnerships of the three countries. Uh, if we can consider just one case, for Brazil, we know uh, the relationship with our neighbors, the South American neighbors, is a necessary and absolute priority. And uh, we never deny that. But what the current world shows is that regional activity is fundamental but not enough in a scenario as complex as the one we face. So diversifying partnership became a part and a, and a very important part of the stabilization both economically and politically, in internationally politically speaking, of our uh, policy. And um, some issues in the world demand this uh, consideration of various regions, re of countries from different regions at once. So wha what we see here is complementarity more than uh, any other thing. It's, I think, the word to explain how we manage uh, these different relationships. In conclusion, uh, we may ask what IBSA brought, and in these three pillars, in, in one pillar it certainly brought more proximity among the chancelleries and, and among the diplomatic missions and more coordination in international fora, which, was, which is not always uh, felt as IBSA because sometimes it involves other countries depending on the, the situation. It also brought this um, exchange <coughs> of experiences among public administrations and sectors of civil society. And the IBSA fund brought small but important contribution to some of the places where it has been implemented. Uh, projects have been implemented. So uh, these can be considered small steps or big steps or significant gains depending on, on our uh, expectations for six years of existence. If we look at the outputs of the, of the third summit, I think the um, conclusion of, of, of the summit is that it has been worthwhile and it's worth to continue this exercise. Only future will tell. 
what is reserved for this grouping, but it's quite singular and interesting. And it's also very interesting to be working in it. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much, um, particularly for helping us understand more clearly the uh, value added of IPSA to both the countries that are part of IPSA, but also to other developing countries throughout the world. Um, before inviting uh, Francis to make his remarks, I do want to indicate that the South African ambassador, Walili Schlapo, uh, had intended to be part of the program today. Unfortunately, he was asked to remain in South Africa by President Zuma, so his absence here uh, is unavoidable. Uh, he cares deeply about this, pro this, this subject, believes it's a very important one, and he just asked me to convey his regrets to, uh, to, the, uh, to the workshop today. Francis, please. Thank you, Howard. Mm. Um, yeah, <clears throat> let, let me say that since I have a, a presentation that I will be making on the next panel, uh, my, my uh, uh, comments will be uh, fa fairly brief. Um, and we, we've, we've already gotten a, a, a fairly, a, a very good comprehensive uh, uh, introduction into IBSA. Um, uh, by my uh, uh, two colleagues here on on the panel. Um, uh, so, ha having said that, uh, uh, you know, first of all, I'm I'm honored to be in a position to uh, try to give a South African uh, government uh, perspective um, in exploring uh, with this ga gathering uh, uh, South Africa's foreign policy as it relates uh, to global governance and South, uh, South uh, corp, uh, Cooperation. But I would also like to um, uh, begin by, by thanking um, uh, the Woodrow Wilson uh, Center for uh, not only inviting me to participate in this uh, gathering, but also to, um, uh, for what ap appears to be, hopefully, uh, uh, and, and, and not a, a one-off uh, uh, initiative, but uh, a, the beginning of an exploring in Washington of uh, issues having to do with uh, emerging powers and the, uh, the global south dimension uh, to international relations and foreign policy. Um, uh, so I, I think uh, uh, the center is to be commended uh, and, and the three programs commended to, uh, you know, for, hope, for, for, for hopefully whetting our appetite for more to come. Um, having said that, I would, I want to uh, make the following points uh, that uh, I think should be stressed, uh, which will uh, be followed up uh, in the next session where I will also be presenting. Uh, suffice it to say at this point that uh, South Africa's commitment uh, to South-South cooperation is one that grows historically and uh, I should say organically um, out of the, the African National Congress's long involvement in the non-aligned movement uh, long, long before the transition uh, that took place in 1994. Uh, and, and it's one that is intimately related uh, to the diplomacy of the liberation struggle um, uh, because all of the, uh, both, both, the, the, both the ANC and PAC were, um, uh, were, were members as liberation movements of, um, of the, of the non-aligned movement, um, uh, uh, the uh, the organization of African unity um, and and various um, uh, a third world Afro Asian Afro Asian Latin American uh, solidarity forums. So um, uh, so South Africa's foreign policy in in that sense is very much an expression of um, of, of this legacy. Um, this, identifi this identification with what we uh, tend to more and more call the Global South 
has been the basis of South Africa's foreign policy vision of focusing on Africa uh, and the South uh, as the priority points of departure in uh, its approach to issues of, of global governance. Uh, and, and here we're talking about uh, uh, a range of issues having to do with um, uh, what has often appeared to be an uphill struggle uh, aimed at reforming, restructuring um, uh, international organizations and institutions. Um, and and this, in, in, this, in this vein, and on South Africa's part, this has been very much reflected in the, in the role that uh, our former uh, minister, uh, uh, of, of, uh, Treasury Minister Trevor Manuel, has played in, in the World Bank's um, uh, Development uh, Committee uh, which has been very much focused on, um, you know, on, on these issues of institutional restructuring. Uh, but this is an approach that, uh, that emphasizes uh, what one might call a, a geopolitics of redress in overcoming uh, uh, the north-south divide uh, regarding economic power and resources in particular and which is focused on developing uh, and, and empowering the African continent from, from South Africa's perspective. And in, in this vein, uh, uh, there, there, is a, there has been a, a, a discussion, debate uh, about uh, ways in which uh, the South might become more uh, uh, coherently organized um, uh, leading up to IBSA. Um, uh, Pre-IBSA, for example, there were uh, uh, notions bandied about of, a, uh, for example, of a, a, a G8 of the South uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a counterpoise to the, uh, uh, to the G8. Um, and and for a while pre IBSA there actually was a, a an informal uh, uh, grouping of um, uh, of India Brazil South Africa uh, Nigeria and Egypt uh, uh, for a period leading up to um, pre uh, preceding the formation of um, of IBSA and the and, and the G20 so. Uh, for for several years preceding IBSA, there 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 has been um, uh, these uh, efforts at uh, uh, trying to bring more uh, coordination uh, between uh, our our countries and other um, uh, 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 countries in the South in. Uh, in coming together and developing an agenda uh, that can uh, have a greater impact multilaterally. Um, in, the, in the wake of the uh, recent elections in South Africa and the taking shape of the new uh, Jacob Zuma administration, uh, all indications point toward an even greater emphasis on South-South cooperation within a foreign policy that uh, 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 that will place uh, a greater priority on uh, economic diplomacy uh, and on consolidating uh, the Africa and South initiatives uh, begun during the Mbeki administration. Uh, hence the refocusing of foreign affairs uh, as a ministry of international uh, relations uh, and, and, and cooperation. The idea being uh, to uh, begin to align uh, more closely uh, South Africa's domestic uh, developmental uh, priorities with its uh, economic uh, relations internationally uh, and on the African continent. Uh, and, and in this vein, uh, that, that under this administration, there there, uh, there are plans afoot to uh, de, uh, where South Africa will develop its own uh, 
uh, Development Assistance uh, Cooperation uh, uh, Agency uh, in in uh, in alignment uh, with uh, what has already been long uh, underway, um, uh, as Ambassador Singh has mentioned, with India, uh, and uh, and 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 Brazil through its institutions such as its uh, development bank. Um, given these indications of foreign policy direction. Uh, the Zuma administration will retain uh, a strong commitment to IBSA as a South-South cooperation vehicle uh, with uh, its two like-minded uh, allies in South America and South Asia who are also in the forefront uh, of engaging uh, a global governance agenda of reform of international institutions and, and uh, uh, and, and trading patterns. Uh, in, in, in closing, I would like to underline these points. In underlining these points, it is instructive to note that in a recent interview by uh, our new Minister of Trade and in Industry, Rob Davies, it was stressed that given the current global economic downturn, and how this was likely to accelerate the relative decline of Western economies. The direction of South Africa's economic diplomacy uh, will be even more concentrated on the global South uh, as the current and future focus of uh, South Africa's economic uh, and, and development uh, 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 pros uh, prospects. Uh, and, and and, and, and here, I think one of the um, uh, one of the sustaining aspects of IBSA that uh, uh, should be focused on quite closely, uh, as the, the two previous speakers have mentioned, and that is the uh, the the infrastructure that has been put in place with uh, the uh, 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 the sectoral um, uh, working groups. Uh, of which there are 16 and maybe more uh, that, have, that have come on stream. Because this is, I think when we talk about South-South uh, cooperation and South-South forums, I mean, there are many. You've got the G77 plus China, uh, the NAM. Um, uh, there, there, is, there is also the new Asia-Africa uh, strategic partnership. Uh, but one one thing that is very substantive about uh, about IBSA's uh, sectoral working groups is that is that these are are actual practical examples of South South cooperation uh, structured around uh, uh, a, an extensive agenda of functional uh, developmental issues and, and 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 of course they are you know of uneven. Um, uh, status in terms of you know different uh, uh, you know how how these working groups are are functioning, but um, but they point towards uh, uh, specific engagements rather than uh, what tends to be the rhetorical flourishes that uh, that often comes out of South South cooperation, where one would tend to say, well, what is it? Uh, uh, so I, I think that is one of the strong points. Another point is is the engagement of of, of civil society, where uh, the three countries have uh, have endeavored to try to uh, uh, make this initiative not simply an intergovernmental um, uh, initiative, but one in which civil society is very much involved as as well. And here. I think in terms of the, there is some historical background and order um, uh, in, in terms of the way um, this uh, dimension has developed over the past few years. Now, as, as uh, um, uh, our, our, our chairman has mentioned, there's been very little focus on South-South uh, uh, cooperation in the United States, but one 
institution that has been very much involved uh, has been the Ford Foundation, and um, uh, uh, which, um, um, uh, particularly through the Brazil office of the Ford Foundation, um, uh, made uh, possible uh, uh, the the development of a network of, um, of, of of South African, Brazilian, Indian scholars um, engaged. Uh, who, uh, many of us who have been engaged uh, uh, cooperatively and separately together over the past few years in looking at issues of uh, of, of peace and security and cooperation. Uh, between uh, our, our three countries, um, uh, so uh, so there is that dimension, and and it's a dimension that uh, that our three countries are trying to um, move further through the various forums that have been mentioned, um, in, including uh, particularly the uh, an, an academic forum that has been set up, and uh, so we would. Um, you know, very much um, uh, welcome uh, uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center in, uh, uh, you know, going beyond this uh, whetting of our appetite to see how we can engage uh, further on these fronts. And I think with that, uh, with those few comments, I will uh, 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 rest it there. Thank you. <clears throat> let's let's uh, give a thanks to all of our uh, panelists. All of these pre presentations I thought were remarkably concise and and uh, very helpful in deepening our collective understanding of of IPSA, its impact, its potential. Um, we are now going to turn to some Q and A. Um, I would ask that if anyone would like to ask a question, you just uh, raise your hand. We'll pass you a microphone because um, this is being webcast. Um, and uh, and please identify yourself and institutional affiliation when you yeah, let when me you just, uh, rise. Uh, um, just to get things started, I, I would just like to invite. Uh, we'll do this package a few questions together and invite our panelists to respond to them collectively. Um, I'd love to hear some further reflections on the impact of the economic. Uh, Crisis, the global economic crisis, uh, on uh, on IPSA, on the, on the countries of IPSA, both in terms of how it, the countries are experiencing the decline or projecting the implications of the, of the decline, and secondly, in terms of what remedial measures are being taken or contemplated in response to uh, what is happening globally. Um, putting that question on the table, let's invite others' questions. Uh, can I have a microphone right here? Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank all the panelists who are here today. Uh, my name is Janelle Naturft. I'm with American University. And I was really interested in the comments that you made about um, there needing to be a stake for for all people, all citizens in each of the countries, including the poorest of the poor. So I wondered if you could address any particular initiatives there may be to make sure that all of the excluded um, subsections of your populations are really brought into this process. Um, perhaps even through, you, you talked about building uh, grassroots institutions, and I think quite often civil society and grassroots institutions have that access to the poorest of the poor where maybe larger trade schemes don't reach them. So if you could address that and perhaps any, any cooperation between your countries um, for, for new ideas in, in that way, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Right over here, please. Right here, here, here. <laughs> uh, Steve McDonald, Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, I find it very, very laudable uh, but remarkable, uh, the, the mention that you made of the uh, UNDP IPSA Trust Fund mm -hmm. and the fact that these monies are going for development in other countries, Cape Verde, Guinea-Bissau, Laos, uh, Haiti, etc., Burundi. Uh, I mean, that's remarkable. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it is, it, tell us the genesis of that, the thinking behind that, that, that it's not development funds for within your own countries uh, in a, in a, you know, a, 
a formation of, of three countries that is, uh, is concerned, that have to be concerned about their own development issues. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, right here in the middle. Amy Kirschenbaum, Inter-American Foundation. <clears throat> As someone who focused my graduate studies on Mercosur, I was interested in pursuing further comment by Secretary de Sosa about the uh, potential for tension between the regional uh, cooperation arrangements and IPSA. Uh, if you could speak to uh, when conflicts have arisen, perhaps give some examples and how they've been handled both in the regional context and through the IPSA framework. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's, let's begin with those four questions. Uh, Ambassador, would you like to lead off? I'll comment on three because I think the fourth was <laughs> directed <laughs> at my colleague. Uh, on the uh, economic uh, crisis and, uh, and uh, how it impacted, uh, in the beginning uh, there was a feeling in India that perhaps we may escape the impact of the economic crisis because our financial institutions were not a part of the uh, subprime uh, problem. And so they were not impacted by that. However, uh, once the crisis began uh, in the Western uh, markets, then there was a drawing down from our stock markets because many people who had invested in the Indian stock markets uh, sort of drew down on their assets to meet their obligations here. So th that led to a decline in the asset values of many of our uh, corporates. Uh, uh, beyond that, many of our uh, companies uh, were also raising money in the global financial markets. So those dried up. As a result, uh, everybody turned to the Indian financial sector. This led to a, a credit squeeze in the Indian financial sector. Uh, therefore, availability of credit for production, for trade, uh, declined. Uh, so that led to some uh, stress on production and decline in production in some sectors. The Indian economy, again, is not a export-based or export-oriented uh, economy. It's largely a domestic-focused economy. So again, for that reason, the, the impact uh, on the overall economy was limited. But uh, uh, there is a segment of our economy uh, which is a very important uh, player in the export and import sector. And for example, the IT sector. Uh, and uh, a significant part of our IT sector is oriented towards exports. So some of our export-linked uh, sectors did suffer. <coughs> so there, there, there was a, a stress there. There was some decline in uh, employment there. So as a result, uh, there has been an impact, uh, perhaps not as significant as uh, the impact in some other markets. Uh, last year, our uh, in last uh, in the previous five years, we were growing at an average of about nine percent per year. And it was very important for us because the kind of things, for example, our Prime Minister mentioned about bringing about inclusive growth. To sustain that kind of inclusive growth, we need to continue growing at 9%, 10%. Uh, because at one level, uh, the Indian economy is doing well. The macro indicators are good. Foreign exchange reserves are good. Estimates say that there are 200 to 250 million people in India who can be classified as middle class or upper middle class. But there are 300 to 350 million <coughs> people who are not a part of the market process. And therefore, the challenge for the government is also to integrate them into the market process. For example, 400 million people in India do not have access to commercial uh, energy. Uh, and so it is both, in a sense, a challenge and an opportunity. It is a challenge because you need to integrate them. It's an opportunity because as they get integrated into the market, they will be generating demand and production, uh, production requirements. So because of that, uh, we need to grow at, a, uh, at high rates of growth. But be because of the impact we've had, the rate of growth is believed to have come down to about 6%. Uh, so from our point of view, it's, 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 it's a decline. It's difficult. Uh, but of course, uh, it's, the decline has not been as much as the declines or the negative growth rates that we've seen uh, in uh, several other uh, parts of the world. Uh, in response to your question about how do we bring in the excluded sections, that is very much uh, part uh, of what is now being attempted. It is relatively new. Uh, IPSA, as my colleague mentioned, is a relatively new forum. It has been in existence for six years. Uh, the initial attempt was to get the institutional structures going at the level of governments. 
and see what messages flow from that. Moving from the governments, they brought in the private sector, the business sectors. Now it is being widened to the level of the people because there is a sense that you have to take it to a people-to-people -people kind of relationship and that will provide the solid basis. It is in that context that we uh, want to uh, uh, not only help build further grassroots institutions but bring them together. And again, uh, we would be sharing uh, experiences based on what we are doing in our own countries uh, to bring in uh, excluded groups. Now, uh, I made a very brief reference that although we have these uh, high rates of growth, uh, but overall rates of growth, but because the challenge we are facing in India, because of a significant section of the uh, population not yet a part of this uh, process, government has to take very determined, conscious steps to bring in them in. And uh, there are several um, uh, schemes that the government had, for example, scheme of providing housing. Uh, the, one of the schemes that has worked very well, uh, which I referred to, is a scheme that uh, a, every family, at least one person, is provided employment for 100 working days. And so that's a kind of, a, uh, of, of, of an insurance, uh, social sector uh, insurance. And because of schemes like this, uh, when the crisis began last year, we did not need to come in with the kind of major stimulus packages that some other countries needed to do because a certain amount of stimulus was already uh, there uh, in the economy. So uh, the attempt of the government clearly is to build further on this and based on our experience, share with our partners and see what, uh, what we can do together. And in response to uh, your question about why, why uh, we are looking at uh, supporting other developed countries, uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, although the cooperation in IPSA framework is relatively new, but South-South cooperation is not a new thing uh, in how we have tried to work. And uh, the Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation Program was set up soon after uh, our independence in the, uh, uh, well, not soon, but about 15, 20 years after that it started in 1964. And since then, we've been trying to, uh, to implement, we cover more than 158 countries. And as uh, our cooperation began in the IPSA framework, there was a feeling that not only must we benefit uh, from each other's interaction uh, and building institutional framework. Uh, for example, one of the things is that there are no uh, good shipping links. I mean, there's a good shipping link between India and South Africa, but there's hardly any good shipping link between India, South Africa, Brazil. Now, what would happen if this kind of a link could be established? So, uh, but going beyond that, um, as we build uh, amongst each other, how can we also support uh, development in uh, through uh, despite our limited means in other countries building on the experience that we've had and so that is why this has been a very important element in the programs that uh, government has gov the three governments have uh, have supported thank you thank you thank you very much for the questions um, I'll, I'll start with the um, Mercosur question uh, IBSA is not a forum for negotiating the IBS, the Mercosur Saku India agreement, and uh, the we understand these are separate things. <coughs> Mercosur has other countries, so when we talk about negotiations of uh, trade negotiations between Brazil and and Saku, we're not talking about negotiations among Brazil and Saku. We're talking about Mercosur. We try to to separate these uh, tracks. It, it's likely that a meeting for discussing uh, the trilateral trade trade arrangement is is going to take place, but it's a separate thing from from IPSA right now. Of course, uh, in IPSA, what we can do is uh, to stimulate our regional partners, in the case of Brazil and South Africa, to participate in this process. But IPSA doesn't negotiate trade. Uh, Apart from this trilateral trade arrangement, there are three, uh, three bilateral um, uh, negotiations in, in place. Mercosur Saku, Mercosur India, which is one of the most advanced negotiations of Mercosur, is with India, and also Saku India have a bilateral negotiation. So the trilateral process is on the top of the three bilateral sides of this triangle. Um, IBSA does have a working group on trade, but mm -hmm. the only uh, thing that we can do in this working group, due to the fact that we participate in Mercosur and we cannot negotiate trade directly, is uh, to talk about trade facilitation. Uh, so the, the role of the working group on trade in IBSA is to 
try and, and put together the institutions in the three countries that participate in, in, uh, in trade, like the ministries of agriculture that have to label products and these kinds of things, and try to see how we can facilitate processes. But there's no uh, tariff negotiation or, or something like that. Um, about the fund, the IBSA fund, um, yes, we believe it's a innovative <coughs> way of, of, of offering cooperation <coughs> in the sense that uh, it's outside the traditional cycle, uh, uh, circle of, of, of countries participating in cooperation and, and the money that is used for the projects of the IBSA fund comes from the three countries only. And, um, there's a lot of north-south cooperation, we know. Now there are lots of uh, new schemes in triangular cooperation. I believe Brazil, United States, and Ghana have established a cooperation in this format. And uh, we are willing to participate in that too. But what is different in the case of IBSA is that we have the, the decision on which institutions, which areas that we are going to extend to other countries. And in triangular mechanisms with a northern country and two southern countries, one receiving and the other one offering cooperation, part of the decision is outside. So that's why we think this is complementary. Um, and, and the idea of the projects of the fund is, whenever possible, to extend practices that were uh, used internally in one of the countries or in more than one to other countries that are interested in them. Um, so we are, we, we, as we said, the three countries know they, they, they are working towards uh, combating inequalities and, and, and social exclusion. They have developed policies in this work, and some of these policies, some of these experiences may sometimes be of use for, for third countries. That's the, the philosophy of the fund. Um, I believe the other questions were already uh, answered. About the financial crisis, uh, I the public communique issued in October in Delhi has a, a, a very long paragraph and very detailed paragraph on global financial crisis. And um, during the, the meeting in October, of course, uh, due to the moment of the meeting in, in, in October, uh, the financial crisis took uh, a lot of space in the discussion, especially when the three heads of state were uh, in contact with the press. So it has been, uh, th there are lots of things have been said about uh, the financial crisis and, and how IPSA is seeing itself in it. About the positions of the countries, uh, each one of them in, in the crisis, uh, I, I don't think I will be able to contribute to anything. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Francis. I, yeah, let, let, me, let me just briefly say, because I think, you know, um, uh, 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 the, these questions have largely been been answered, but um, on the on, on the issue of grassroots uh, participation, uh, uh, while I IBSA as uh, as IBSA does not have a uh, a joint grassroots strategy as such, uh, uh, nevertheless the uh, the working groups uh, do provide a uh, and are providing. Uh, a forum by which the three countries are able to exchange experiences and best practices uh, uh, that can be uh, uh, mutually beneficial uh, in, 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 in each of their countries. Um, uh, and uh, for example, there is, uh, all three countries are uh, <clears throat> within the IBSA framework uh, have uh, committed themselves to working together on on HIV AIDS um, uh, at, and it w within the framework of uh, of uh, you know of of overcoming the challenge of 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 poverty and um, uh, and 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 challenges in in the health sector. Uh, so so that's one specific. Uh, kind of uh, cooperation that that can um, uh, resonate in that area. Also, um, uh, e exchanging experiences on uh, on on social delivery. Uh, for example, there was a there was a joint study 
done by the um, uh, that, uh, uh, by the Sectoral Working Group on Public uh, Service and Administration looking at um, the performance of, um, uh, of, of service centers uh, in, in the three countries and, uh, and, and how, um, uh, you know, these, uh, the, uh, uh, how service delivery uh, has been pursued uh, in in the three countries in developing lessons learned and and um, and best practices uh, that could be um, you know uh, that could be fed back into uh, the three countries to to improve social delivery. South Africa, for example, has been very much um, uh, uh, affected by the issue of. Um, uh, service delivery. I mean, this this is this is a major. Uh, I mean, th th this has had major political, uh, domestic, um, uh, a re a resonance, uh, and uh, and and therefore the kinds of sharing of experiences. Um, Brazil, for example, has had uh, a a long track record in developing uh, s uh, service delivery centers. Uh, uh, India, through its decentralized uh, uh, system of of state governments, has a a a, uh, a plural a, a a very interesting pluralistic experience in that regard. And uh, looking at those experiences has been very helpful in um, <clears throat> in the development in South Africa of what. Uh, uh, were established a few years ago called multi uh, um, uh, 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 multi service centers uh, um, uh, which are being set up in um, it, it's a uh, there, there's a process of setting these up in 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 uh, in, in several of the provinces uh, districts and so forth so th so this is a very uh, specific example of how Trilateral cooperation can address issues of um, uh, grassroots development and exclusion in in the three countries. So it's it's mainly through this kind of um, sharing of experiences, exchanging ideas, uh, and identifying best practices that uh, that we will be able to uh, you know uh, address these challenges. Thank you. Uh, our second round. <coughs> we have a microphone over here, please. Uh, Jim Loeb, Interpress Service. Um, I'm interested in kind of the, the media aspect of this. Are there uh, media programs contemplated? Uh, you know, going back into history, as some of you did, obviously the non-aligned news agencies didn't pool, didn't work out really well and information ministries have been generally discarded, uh, especially during the 80s. And now you have some enterprises that appear to be kind of representative of the Global South or seeking to, to be, such as um, is it Telesur that's sponsored by Venezuela and to some extent Al Jazeera, at least in the Arab world. <coughs> is there much uh, discussion or any at all uh, within IBSA about media initiatives that would possibly be more comprehensive in terms of the Global South? Or is this way too ambitious at this point? Thank you. Uh, over here on the, fine. Hi, Lily Brigger with the Council on Hemispheric Affairs. Um, I was interested in the issue of agricultural subsidies and particularly um, the bloc's interest in the Doha rounds. Clearly it's stalled and it will be for the foreseeable future. Um, but eventually when the rich countries do open these up, the benefits won't be distributed equally. N namely, Brazil will benefit probably most from this, but poorer countries in the developing world who don't have access to international markets 
um, will continue to be stunted by this. And you mentioned exchanges of um, agricultural technology and processing um, and this fund. And I would like to know if you could expand on that more and what the three countries are doing um, in, in, in smaller developing countries to uh, bridge this gap uh, between sustenance farmers and international markets. Thank you. And then could you pass the uh, microphone right across the way to, yeah, right down there? No, right there. You just passed. <laughs> oh, okay. Hey, uh, Next. Sorry. It's okay. We'll get both. Uh, in fact, I want to follow up on this question. Uh, it's a bilateral issue. Uh, there is a wave of alarm going into many of these uh, African countries, particularly, for example, Amanoromo from Ethiopia. There is an involvement by Brazil on a coffee farm and uh, overseas farming by India to provide back home uh, some uh, food needs, and which in the process is uprooting the indigenous people within those, con uh, within those countries. How are you going about it? Uh, what do you really think about it? Uh, up to now, it's not a big farm, it's not a big development, but uh, Brazil is just expanding right now into uh, a coffee farm all over the uh, Oromo coffee area. In fact, the largest <coughs> coffee producing and, and the, one of the largest coffee producing in the country. And uh, Ethiopia, as known, is prone for its famine. But agriculture, overseas agriculture, is being expanded both by India and China. And how would you explain it? Thank you. And then right in front of you. Hi, Isabel Munia from the World Resources Institute. Um, I'm curious if you could um, comment on um, what is the role of IPSA in working to reform the Bretton Woods institutions, and then how you would be working together and then how you're will be working separately on that issue. Thank, Thank you. you. Who would like to go first? <laughs> Thank you for the questions. I think they cover a great array of e very interesting issues. Uh, starting with the um, media initiatives in IPSA, there's this uh, editor's forum which is one of the people to people, so-called forums that meet in parallel or at the margins of the summits. The last uh, editor's forum took place in New Delhi in October 13th, 14th. Uh, yeah, about IPS specifically, Mr. Lubetkin was there with us some time ago, <coughs> maybe one month ago. And we are uh, trying and studying how IPS specifically can be involved in, in Let's see how can it be involved in the next editor's forum that we intend to organize at the margins of the fourth IBSA summit in Brasilia in October. Um, it, during the discussions of the editor's forum, this issue was always raised. I mean, not only in Delhi, but in the previous edition of the editor's forum in South Africa. The old issue of the n new order of communication that we know that goes back to the 70s and India specifically had a, a lot uh, a great role in this discussion for a long time um, but it's still only this discussion in the forum uh, <coughs> let's see what can happen this year and uh, hopefully extend this debate to other uh, areas and uh, other institutions I it's present but it hasn't turned into any result yet. Uh, about um, agricultural cooperation, yes, IBSA Fund has uh, financed this project in Guinea-Bissau and uh, the three countries of IBSA have uh, expertise in, in, in different areas of agriculture. Um, I can maybe say a little more about Brazil. Embrapa, which is the Brazilian enterprise for agriculture, is uh, currently cooperating with uh, a great variety of countries. Sometimes our problem with Embrapa is that we don't have enough personnel to 
um, attend the demand of, of cooperation in, in agricultural technology. Um, in the case of, of uh, ethanol specifically, we are committed to transferring technology for the countries that are interested. About the Doha round, you know, um, if we, we don't know yet um, if it's true that some countries won't benefit. We don't believe that. We believe countries have a great um, reason to, to see that the um, elimination of subsidies specifically would be of interest of most of the world because that's a practice that should be uh, eliminated because of the results of the last round. So, uh, and if there weren't uh, some convergence among a great number of developing countries in this issue, a meeting like the one we had in Hong Kong, which was the last ministerial meeting, with, s with 110 countries that were demanding the same thing, wouldn't exist. I mean, you, you don't put together 110 countries if they don't see a reason for that. Uh, but you know, I'm, I'm, I don't work in the economical area and probably know better than me the arguments and, and the positions of our country in this. And about the Doha round, we, we well, as well. I, I don't think I need to, to go back to that. Um, about Bretton Woods institutions, I believe in this case, uh, the IBSA, uh, the, the convergence of position amongst the three IBSA countries is only part of a broader uh, movement to reform these institutions. So, of course, the forum and the, the, the getting together of these three countries and how the people in, in their, uh, involved in their uh, chancelleries and in, the, in, the, in the, their ministries involved in these issues being together, this is a, a part of, uh, this facilitates uh, any position that they can uh, take, but the format of negotiations going on about this issue is broader than IPSA. Other countries are involved, as we know, and uh, so uh, the, the forum just has this no, uh, indirect uh, externality in, in the negotiations in place. And uh, what, what we do in IPSA is just to reaffirm the uh, uh, consensus we have among the three countries of the importance of that, of the democratization and, and of the reforms. Did I forget anything? I think that's okay. pretty much. Thank you very much. Yes, in fact, uh, I, I don't want to repeat what uh, my colleague mentioned because I think he answered uh, several of the questions quite comprehensively. But just on the, uh, on the Bretton Woods uh, and the international financial institutions, just to say that uh, you know, uh, this is this this process is something that uh, countries like ours have been talking about and working on for quite some time, and it is not only within the framework of developing countries. Now, for example, uh, on several occasions, in the context of G8 and the meeting between G8 and the outreach countries, uh, the outreach countries had put together joint position uh, papers, uh, mm -hmm. which were passed on, and even in that, there were references. Uh, to the need for reform of the global financial uh, architecture uh, at the global financial institutions. And uh, again, in the G20, uh, which has been meeting uh, now fairly actively since uh, November last year, uh, the process of reform of the global financial institutions is also being looked at. Uh, and and uh, that is one of the things that uh, is being asked for. And again, all three countries are very much a part of the process. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I'd I'd like to uh, uh, make uh, make a comment on the uh, particularly on the the question from the brother from Ethiopia about um, uh, you know countries outside of the continent um, uh, making arrangements for growing food. Uh, but I think the two questions, you know, the one, the one having to do with agricultural subsidies and, and the question um, having to do with uh, of, of food, um, uh, get, get at, at something which, which is a real contradiction um, uh, within South-South cooperation, and that is the fact that you do have a, a sort of a class stratification, so, so to speak, between 
uh, uh, big developing countries, uh, um, uh, your, 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 your so-called emerging uh, powers in the South, and, uh, and, and those countries that are much poorer and, 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 and least developed. Uh, and that, that, is a, that, that is a tension that exists uh, and, uh, you know, with, within the African context. Uh, particularly in Southern Africa, that has that has uh, 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 played itself out within the dynamics of uh, of of SADC, uh, the Southern African Development Community, and SACU uh, between South Africa and its neighbors, um, uh, and uh, and and in, in fact, we can we can actually see the how those contradictions play out in the um, in the way in which the European Union's um, uh, economic pop, uh, ec economic partnership agreements have have uh, literally discombobulated uh, the African integration agenda, and and this is something that uh, that uh, you know I know in a in 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 a in a seminar that I'm I'm going to organize uh, later this year on free trade areas. This is going to be a a, a major issue in how uh, you know, you know, our integration agendas are affected ex externally, but the question about food uh, is, and the alarm that um, some African countries are having, uh, in in some ways, is is a problem that um, reflects back on 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 African incapacities in 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 the sense that. One of the things that we're very much concerned about, and, and, and many of us as analysts are trying to engage right now, and, uh, and myself and one of my uh, colleagues uh, have an article coming out in the um, uh, uh, African political science journal Politicon, and that is the whole issue of Africa and um, uh, Africa and external, the, the, how Africa interacts with external powers. Because everyone is sort of coming into Africa these days. You've got China, um, uh, uh, well, China, India, Brazil, Turkey, you name it. The, the, uh, the African Union does not, does not have a, a strategy. Uh, the regional economic communities do not have a strategy. Africa, by and large, uh, uh, is more is is more reactive than proactive, and the problem that we're dealing with, which uh, which reflects those issues, is the fact that with Africa, because you have 53 odd sovereign countries, we're saddled with what I call the one in the many. The one external power, be it China, or um, uh, you know, or, or or the U.S. or or whomever, and you ha and uh, a problem of coordinating among 53 countries so that you have problems in terms of coming up with common policies, uh, and and this is why we we have we we have situations. For example, and Madagascar is a very good example. Uh, part of the instability in Madagascar was triggered by the. Uh, by the report that 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 Korea was going to lease, uh, uh, you know, half of Madagascar's arable land, uh, about which very few questions have been raised about w what even the implications of that would be, given the fact that uh, uh, Madagascar only has has ten percent of its original rainforest, and. Uh, uh, so, so these are these are questions that backwash not just on agriculture but on, on environmental, and ecological integrity in countries, and this is something that, uh, that is not being coherently dealt with. There is, uh, outside of IBSA, uh, although it, and IBSA does have a sectoral working group on, um, uh, on the environment and climate change and and so forth, but. Uh, take the new Asia Africa Strategic Partnership. Now, this is actually a a forum uh, set up uh, in commemoration of the Bandung movement. 
that actually ought to be um, sorting out and coordinating these issues of, of, about how Africa engages with the emerging powers of Asia in different uh, uh, economic uh, areas of engagement. But, uh, um, uh, but the NASP, uh, so to speak, has, be, has, has basically been, uh, at least from, from, from uh, to my knowledge, has been basically non-functional. So what you have is that instead of, in, 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 instead of having a new Asia-Africa strategic partnership, uh, you, what you have are individual uh, uh, Asian engagements with, uh, with, you know, with, uh, w with the AU and, you know, uh, forums like FOCOC and so forth. So, uh, uh, yes, there, there's reason for alarm, but, but it means that, uh, it means that Africa is going to have to get itself together. Uh, South Africa, for its part, has been trying to, to, uh, 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 uh to be a catalyst in, um, uh, in, in, in pushing this agenda, um, uh, you know, so uh, I, I think that's about as much as one can say on that at this, mo at this moment. Thank you very much. Uh, I would be interested in hearing a bit more of Brazilian and Indian reflections on the role of China and some of these same issues. Uh, we have time for maybe two more questions. Uh, this gentleman right here, and the, the gentleman <coughs> here, down here. <laughs> Why am I having... Uh, the gentleman here I was pointing to was right in the middle here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. A little bit closer, please. Microphone's not on. Hello? It's on? Hello. <laughs> All right. Uh, my name is Luis Serapião from Howard University, uh, originally from Mozambique. Uh, I would like to know about IPSA program. In other words, I know that some members of IPSA have been helping individual countries, developing nations. For instance, Brazil has been helping Guinea-Bissau, as you just mentioned, but has been helping Mozambique. I would like to know if IPSA has IPSA has a special program of helping individual <coughs> countries. For instance, the president of Mozambique, Gibuza, he is involved with this program of what they call it absolute poverty reduction. Can Gibuza approach IPSA? Is IPSA? I'm not talking uh, approaching South Africa, South Africa, or Brazil, or Brazil, but IPSA is IPSA. Can he approach to IPSA? Do we have such a program? Thank you. And for our last question, right in the back. Yeah, uh, Chia Chen, freelance correspondent. I was late, uh, but uh, from my observation, uh, from the question, seems uh, the crime change uh, did not come out. And uh, I just uh, want to see that uh, this ESPA, how to deal with this. If later they're going to talk about cap, will be on the nation base or on the population base. And we got to understand the climate change is cumulative from 100 years of uh, personal lifestyle and uh, industry uh, uh, production. Uh, so I would like to know what's the strategy of the South going to ask uh, North to have technology transfer, because now the important thing is it. two things. One is personal lifestyle, and second is uh, clean technology for production. So I think North should be, for the sake of the world, should transfer the uh, clean technology to the South. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who would like to lead off? Uh, OK. Thank you again, Ambassador. Um, about Mozambique, I would say yes and yes. Uh, yes, there is the IPSA fund, which is uh, focused towards um, extending cooperation to third countries up outside IPSA. And yes, Mozambique has approached the IPSA fund. 
uh, we believe in India specifically. And uh, project idea has been presented. Hopefully we will discuss this uh, next week in New York in, in, in a meeting with the uh, with UNDP, together with other countries that have also presented proposals for the fund. So cooperation with Mozambique is in, in, in process of, of being started. And uh, the, the pillar of, the, the of IBSA, which is involved with that, is the IBSA Facility Fund. Uh, about uh, China, uh, before talking about China, I would, I'd just like to remember the professor uh, mentioned initiatives from countries outside Africa, in Africa. Uh, we participate in the South American Africa Forum, mm -hmm. ASA, mm -hmm. uh, and we believe this is a very interesting format because we talk from continent to continent. Mm -hmm. As in IBSA, we talk from country to country. Uh, and, and this is how we try to overcome mm -hmm. the difficulties Professor has presented. Um, sometimes we think it could be easier if one isolated country could go there and offer what he wants and, and take back what he wants, but not, that's not the way we, we would like mm -hmm. to work. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, South America Africa Forum uh, is doing only what uh, the African Union, together with the countries represented there, and in our side, UNASUR <laughs> understand that should be done, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and we, we think it should be kept that way. Mm -hmm. uh, in the same way, we have a forum of South American countries with Arab countries, mm -hmm. right. also a, a talk among two regions. That's how we try to work on that. Um, about uh, transfer of technology, I wouldn't know exactly what to say, uh, just that in, in, in IPSA there is a working group on, on science and technology, but we are more focused on um, how we can uh, learn from <coughs> the experiences the two other countries had in some areas of, of technological development. And it's quite interesting to see that in IPSA we have, for example, three countries with very strong Antarctic programs, mm -hmm. three countries with, with some space program mm -hmm. and some knowledge in this area, in uh, nanotechnology. So there are areas in which India, Brazil, or South Africa have knowledges and, and in which we can uh, in establish exchanges. I believe three million dollars have been uh, designed for that purpose, not within IBSA, but unilaterally by the countries, but for projects that necessarily involve researchers in the three IBSA countries. Mm -hmm. So there's Indian money, there's South African money, and there had been Brazilian money for projects among researchers in the three countries that can find complementarities among their universities. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Francis? Uh, well, let, let me just, just briefly say I th uh, th there, is a, um, there, there is a priority within IBSA and I think w and, and one of the working groups dealing on uh, climate change and, and the environment. I'm not uh, I'm not aware, aware of of any uh, joint strategies that necessarily have come up that um, would uh, specifically address uh, north-south uh, technology transfer uh, and 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 you know, but but I I I think it's an area where where the where the three countries might uh, you know try might try at some point to develop a a south-south uh, uh, focus on um, on you know addressing climate change uh, uh, aside from the the north-south debate on on climate change because uh, I, I mean one of the one of the one of the areas that uh, particu particularly in in Africa that uh, uh, th that is in, in important in terms of climate change is is the you know is is uh, is, is defending against um, uh, deforestation uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the great uh, Central African rainforest belt uh, is 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 one one of the along with the Amazon is one of the last. Uh, uh, areas of of uh, of you know of of rainforest uh, in the world. So there 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 has to be there there basically has to be a south south strategy on uh, climate change. Um, 
apart from you know debating with the North uh, about uh, 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 climate change, uh, uh, our, our our countries will have to come up with strategies on how we can um, uh, stem the deterioration of uh, of natural resources. Uh, 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 in 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 order to um, you know guard against catastroph catastrophic catastrophic uh, uh, climate change impacts in terms of drought uh, 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 um, floods and and so forth, uh, which is which is something which is uh, uh, you know quite at a level of of, of crisis uh, proportion in much of, of in much of Asia, uh, where there has been. Uh, a lot of uh, denuding of uh, of natural forests. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, just to briefly supplement what uh, my other panel co panelists have said uh, in response to the uh, questions from our friend from Mozambique, uh, that uh, yes, you can, uh, as uh, my colleague from Brazil said, uh, uh, ask for uh, funding from IBSA as IBSA. Uh, but naturally, the, uh, re since there is no IPSA secretariat, uh, mm -hmm. the request initially gets routed through one of the countries. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in the case of Mozambique, it, uh, India and Mozambique uh, then brought it to IPSA for funding. And that's uh, it, where it is now being looked at for funding by IPSA. And uh, it was a project sought for funding uh, from IPSA, not from India but naturally routed through India because there is no IPSA secretariat. So that's, that's how that uh, uh, mechanism works. Uh, uh, referring to some of the comments on, for example, climate change, at the second IPSA summit, a working group was set up on environment mm -hmm. and climate change. <coughs> and I find that among the um, uh, trilateral agreements that we have, for, uh, for example, there's an agreement uh, on uh, cooperation in biofuels. Uh, there is also uh, MOU related to uh, wind energy. And so efforts are being made to see how together uh, we can tackle uh, some of these issues. Uh, in the context of some of the uh, comments that have been made uh, uh, related to Africa, uh, again, uh, we of course have uh, cooperation programs and relationships uh, individually uh, with different African countries, but we, are al we also have important relationship uh, with the uh, AU. Uh, with the Economic uh, Commission for Africa. Mm -hmm. And last year, we also uh, started the process of the Africa-India Summit, mm -hmm. and where uh, a, a significant number of uh, leaders of African countries uh, came to India, and they, were, they had a summit meeting with the Indian leadership uh, to also see how we can work out um, a, a position on a continent-wide basis, which would uh, benefit uh, all concerned. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. Um, thanks to all of you. I found this panel absolutely fascinating, and I want to thank each of our panelists for their contributions this morning. Thank you very much. <laughs> We're going to take a 10-minute break. Is that correct, Paolo? Where are you? Okay, well, 10-minute break, and then we will turn to our second panel.